Hi everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. It is good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. The White House is still negotiating with Republicans on an infrastructure deal, and we're seeing more signs of dissent brewing in the Democratic ranks. President Biden is meeting with lead GOP negotiator Senator Shelley Moore Capito Monday after rejecting her latest counteroffer. Friday's proposal added about $50 billion more in new spending to the Republicans' previous offer of $257 billion. The White House was hoping that number would be closer to one trillion. The two sides also remain far apart on how to pay for the plan and even the definition of infrastructure. It comes as President Biden and Vice President Harris make their first international trip since taking office. White House officials are hosting NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg before President Biden departs for Europe later this week. The president will work to restore U.S. alliances at a G7 summit in the U.K., followed by a NATO summit in Brussels. The trip concludes with President Biden's first meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Geneva. Here's why National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan views the face-to-face face summit as essential. He has a highly personalized style of decision making and so it is important for President Biden to be able to sit down with him face to face to be clear about where we are, to understand where he is, to try to manage our differences and to identify those areas where we can work in America's interests to make progress. When President Biden returns to Washington next week, we believe that we will be in a materially stronger position to manage the major threats and challenges this country faces. COVID, climate, China, cyber, Russia, and shaping the rules of trade and technology for the future. Vice President Harris met with Guatemala's president during the first leg of her diplomatic trip to Central America. She's been tasked with addressing the root causes of migration to the U.S. CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe reports from Guatemala City. On her first international trip as vice president, Kamala Harris told Guatemala's president her goal is to restore hope to the country's struggling residents. To let them know that they are seen, that they are heard. But behind the pleasantries, it's a high-stakes mission for the vice president to address the root causes of illegal immigration to the U.S. Do you consider the governments of El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, or any other in this region to be corrupt? On the issue of corruption, uh, the conversation that I had with President Jamate today was very frank and very candid, and I think this is a quality that he and I appreciate in each other. As the two leaders were speaking, the Biden administration announced a task force to combat human smuggling and corruption in Central America. The Guatemalan President Alejandro Yamate says what's driving migration from his country is the economy. People leave due to lack of opportunities. In our travels, we saw the everyday struggles of some people here. Lorenzo let her oldest son go north to Houston, where he works and sends back money for the family. When was the moment that you knew he had to go to the United States? We saw that there were some who went who already have a house. They have clothes for their family. The vice president expressed compassion for those struggles, but delivered a blunt message. Do not come. Saying the border is sealed and undocumented migrants will be turned away. Ed O'Keefe, CBS News, Guatemala City. Nancy Cordes, Eugene Scott, and Liz Goodwin join me now. Nancy is CBS News Chief White House Correspondent. Eugene is a national political reporter for The Washington Post. And Liz is the Boston Globe's Washington Bureau Chief. Welcome. Good to have you all. Eugene, let me start with you. Former President Trump's public disregard for NATO damaged relations with some of the U.S.'s closest European allies. How has that impacted the Biden administration? Well, that's put a lot of pressure on the Biden administration to uh, make it very clear to our allies that we share the same worldview uh, in, in areas that it became uh, questionable with under uh, Trump, especially related to uh, climate change, as well as issues of national security with some of our adversaries and, and trade. And so, um, you know, the whole uh, foundation of Biden's campaign very much was about returning America to a period of time uh, where some of the conflicts and issues that arose during the Trump administration, uh, you know, were not the norm. And that is what he's going to try to uh, reemphasize when he gets the opportunity to meet with uh, our allies in NATO. 
But Liz, it's interesting, after taking some criticism about potentially giving Russian President Vladimir Putin legitimacy by giving him a face-to-face -face meeting, President Biden confirmed today that he will meet with Ukrainian President Zelensky. So has the White House indicated what is on the agenda? Yeah, the Jake Sullivan was very careful to announce simultaneously today to reporters that Biden will welcome Zelensky to the White House sometime later this summer. Um, he was fairly vague about what would be on the agenda, aside from, you know, a commitment to this country who's been a close ally. Um, Zelensky has made it clear that he would like to talk about the pipeline and the U.S. not sanctioning uh, German interests that are involved in that pipeline, which they feel is going to strengthen Russia. And I imagine that will definitely be on the agenda. Well, Nancy, on Sunday, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm told CNN that U.S. adversaries are capable of shutting down the U.S. power grid. Why admit that vulnerability and how will that be addressed in President Biden's upcoming trip? Well, you know, I don't know that she uh, let a really big cat out of the bag there because we all just saw what happened with the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline, essentially uh, ground mm -hmm gasoline use to a halt uh, in the southeast of the U.S. So it's not much of a leap to assume that, um, you know, evildoers could have the same kind of impact on the U.S. electrical grid. And keep in mind that the administration is sort of trying to um, shake the trees and alert energy companies throughout the U.S. that they need to upgrade their cybersecurity, and they're trying to convince Congress to spend about $100 billion to upgrade the electrical grid as part of the president's uh, infrastructure plan. So uh, they see it as being uh, not just prudent, but in their interest to alert everyone, look, there are some big holes in our cybersecurity when it comes to the nation's infrastructure. And when it comes to something as critical as the electrical grid, it's worth putting money into it to, to upgrade it. And we'll see if they're able to make that case to you at the U.S. Congress that they need all $100 billion to do it. Well, you know, Eugene, it feels like we have been talking about infrastructure for a very, very long time. And the White House says that the Republicans' latest counterproposal on infrastructure fails to meet President Biden's objectives. Realistically, does it seem a bipartisan deal is possible? Or do you think the attempt at bipartisanship, even if it fails, is what's important for the president here? Well, I think you're, you have to ask yourself which demographic you're speaking about. To Democrats, the attempt is noteworthy, but this is not uh, of a high value to Democratic voters because uh, their perception of Republicans is that this is a group of lawmakers that it's not easy to work with because of an unwillingness to be compromising. But to Republicans who perhaps uh, are afraid of uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party maybe having too much influence in lawmaking, uh, Biden showing them that he actually tried to work with Republican lawmakers could be valuable, especially heading into midterms uh, when uh, Biden is going to have to uh, give an account perhaps for what he was able to do and what he wasn't able to do, but more importantly about whether or not he was able to work with uh, the other side of the aisle, something he, something he campaigned on uh, in 2020 and something that won him the support of, uh, of quite a few conservative voters. Well, Liz, is it clear whether Senate Majority Leader Schumer can round up the votes necessary to pass the president's infrastructure plan? It's definitely not clear yet. And I think a lot of it goes back to what Eugene was just saying, which is you have Senator Joe Manchin, a moderate, coming out saying he doesn't really want to support bills that don't have any Republican support to them um, in the future. And so if Joe Biden isn't able to get Republican support for this infrastructure bill, which would be a steep climb. They're something like $700 billion apart at this point. The question is, is that enough for someone like Manchin and some of the other more moderate Democrats to feel like, OK, a good faith effort was made. Uh, Republicans just aren't budging on this. And I feel comfortable voting for this on a party line vote. And I think that's what remains to be seen um, as these negotiations go forward. Biden hasn't said, you know, how long he's willing to let them drag out. But I think um, he's he's trying to, you know, show that he's not 
that he's taking them seriously, because that's what senators like Manchin on the Democratic side need to see. Yeah, so on Sunday, Nancy, Senator Manchin reiterated his support for the filibuster and said he would vote against the Democrats' um, elections bill, saying the debate had become too politicized. And you asked White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki what this means for the future of the For the People Act. I want to play some of that. Let's listen. If he's against the For the People Act, does that mean that, uh, for all intents and purposes, at least for right now, it is dead? I'm certainly not going to make that prediction. As you know, there can be many ups and downs of legislation moving forward. And uh, as I noted earlier, he's been the president's been clear he's willing to work with anyone to enact uh, common sense reforms that benefit the American people, that make it easier to vote. He'll have those discussions with Democratic leadership, and we'll work together on what the path forward looks like. So, Nancy, what are the options the White House is considering to move their agenda forward? They don't have many great options at this point, Elaine, because the reality was that even before uh, Joe Manchin came out and said explicitly he does not support this legislation, uh, they were still going to need 60 senators to get on board to overcome a filibuster. And it was uh, very unclear and still is that there are ever going to be 10 Republican votes for this voting rights legislation. Um, the, the, the Manchin announcement was sort of the, the nail in the coffin, if you will. Now, there are plenty of Democratic allies who are going to try to, to meet with Manchin. He's meeting with civil rights leaders. Some of his fellow Democrats are talking with him to try to convince him to come around. But really, uh, he would have to support not just the voting rights legislation, but doing away with the filibuster altogether in order for Democrats to be able to pass this legislation. And he has said no to both. So these are very high hurdles indeed. The alternatives aren't great. Uh, Democrats could try to break this bill up into pieces, maybe try to just pass the things that Joe Manchin says he's okay with and that maybe uh, 10 Republicans would be okay with, but that's going to be a really watered down version of the uh, the, the massive voting uh, piece of voting legislation that they were hoping to pass. And, and the White House at this point, all it can do is really utilize the bully pulpit of the presidency because the action is really taking place on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, Liz, what pressure is the White House getting from Democrats in swing states? There's a, a lot of outcry on the state level, especially in Arizona, Texas, Georgia, where Democrats feel like they've been waging a battle against some of these voting restrictions, essentially without backup from the White House. It felt to them like in, uh, until last week, there really hadn't been a sense of urgency or alarm on the federal level for the wave of legislation on the state level in some Republican-controlled legislatures to cut back early voting, to put up different restrictions, and then some that are even more concerning is uh, the, the legislation that takes pieces of the electoral process and puts them in more partisan hands. In some states, those bills are being considered. And so they really are, um, you know, crying out for help. Well, Eugene, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan described election reform as a matter of national security. Here's what he said. We are trying to show the world that American democracy and democracy writ large can work, can effectively deliver the will of the people, and to the extent that we are not updating, refurbishing, revamping our own democratic processes and procedures to meet the needs of the modern moment, then we are not going to be as successful in making that case to the rest of the world. Well, Eugene, despite no evidence of widespread election fraud in 2020, Republicans have gone from challenging election results in courts to challenging them in legislatures and now are pursuing audits of certified elections. Explain the difference in what Jake Sullivan is saying and what Republicans are saying about election security. Well, what Sullivan is saying is that if America is to be a leader and an example to the rest of the world for uh, fair elections uh, and elections that can be trusted and not, uh, you know, overturned in popular opinion, at least within uh, one political party, uh, then they 
Americans will have to uh, make a strong commitment to expanding voting rights and securing voting rights and trusting the system to operate in the way that uh, it currently has. And that has revealed Joe Biden to be the winner. Uh, there's also concern about the influence of China and Russia on countries that are uh, less developed and uh, could be could be in need of some type of assistance and leadership and supervision, even in the areas of elections. And if uh, the Republican Party and other people who are casting doubt uh, in the American election system uh, continue to do so, that perception could uh, spread internationally, leading some of these countries to have more confidence in the election systems of China and Russia than that of the U.S. Hmm. All right. Well, Nancy Cordes, Eugene Scott, and Liz Goodwin, thanks to you all. Really appreciate it.